Hey, 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 welcome back to another Tuesday Live podcast with your host, Jen and Joe. I am Joe Delafave. And I'm his wife, Jen. And we're super excited today to come live. We've got a bunch of questions that we can answer. And if you're tuning in, as always, drop them in the comments below. And if you're re-watching, drop your comments and maybe we could shoot them, um, get to them next time when we come live and uh, answer more questions for you. Well, one of our favorite things to do is to go live and give back and actually answer some of the questions that we see quite often in our real estate business. And yes, we do deals. We are full-time, you know, homeschooling parents as well. So a lot of the questions we get are, how are you doing the business? How are you juggling that in homeschooling? Things like that. And so it's pretty cool to, it wasn't like this was our master plan when we first got started doing this. I don't know. It might have been your master plan. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't think like homeschooling and <laughs> no, all that. No, I didn't either. I thought that was for uh, people who had a ton of extra time on their hands and, you know, something in, that only other people could do. And we've realized a lot in 2020. And one of those things was, wow, we could do this. And we don't have a ton of extra time, but you don't need eight hours a day to homeschool your two kids or four kids, whatever you've got. You just need a desire to do it just like anything else in life. And so we can definitely chat about that. But it's been a crazy journey. And I, I keep reflecting um, about how far we've come because in the very beginning, the first two properties, did you, like, what was your vision when we seriously bought one property together well really it was just you and i was like hanging out kind of like this guy's nuts but no. <laughs> well i guess what was happened so rewind all live from the beginning when i first met jen uh we were dating for about two to three weeks my grandparents every year would rent this house in florida and i'd always want to go visit them but by myself right so i meet her and i knew right away she was a different caliber um so i was like hey do you want to go on this trip with me i'm gonna go visit my grandparents in Florida and Jen being a teacher had that week off from school. Mm -hmm. So she was crazy enough to say, yeah. So our first 30 day anniversary, one month anniversary, we're together like on a cruise ship. Cause we even took like a couple day cruise. Yeah. But when we went to Florida, I saw how my grandparents in the winter time where it's freezing in upstate New York and it's February, March, April, and how gorgeous it is there. I said, you know, that's my dream one day is I would love to have a retirement, the ability to have a house in Florida and I don't have to worry about being in the snow, but I don't also want to work till I'm 80 unless I really want to. I want to have that extra income. So I knew we wanted to start buying these houses. And when I got that course in the year 2000 from Ron the Grand, I watched the market from 2001, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It was really kind of going up. Um, and that was really kind of part of the reason why I think it took a dip right after that. And that's when Myself and Jen met and we started getting back into it because we were just finding deals. And mm -hmm. I don't even know if you knew because you were teaching, but I was like, hey, I just found this house, which I think is a really good deal. And I'm thinking like, I remember that one, it was in Gates, New York, right outside of Rochester. And we walked in and it smelled so bad, like <laughs> cat pee or dog pee or both that, that you turned above. around and you did a 180 out the door i, I remember exactly what house it was a it white was. one with yeah. like broken front steps i don't know how many cats there must have been in that house but well no because i i mean i had the mentality back then was i i had gone to college i did my four years now i'm barely making ends meet on a teacher salary having to pay out of pocket for my master's degree to, to go teach middle school english because that's just what you had to do plus i was trying to make my mortgage payments and like looking back on it it's just like a crazy way of starting out but it was the mindset of well this is what it is and this is how it has to be and then you come along and you're like no that you know that that the end of your career not knocking teachers but the end of your career you're going to get a little bell and and what right like maybe some good pension maybe health care and yes you're touching a lot of lives but I was like, oh, well, there, there's something more that we could do. Like, and that's when that little bit of, huh, like what, what goes on on the other side? And that's where I started to see the bigger picture of it doesn't have to be a certain way just because you went to school or just because this was the road you started off on. And for me, that was a bit of a shift. And I had family that when I walked away from teaching, they were not happy with me, like literally disappointed. Right. And uh, that's, that's a hard feeling to to have as a daughter. Um, but at the same time, I knew I wanted to stay home and raise my babies and I wanted to support you and didn't quite know exactly what we grow into today. But, you know, I look back and how proud I am of that. 
of that younger version of myself for really sticking it out because sometimes it's not always easy to, to follow your dreams and, and really pursue your passions and your, create your own future instead of doing what other people think you should. Well, and I think that's how I got here because I was always a daydreamer. Mm, yeah. I was always the daydreamer. And with me growing up the way I did, you know, like cars would break down on the side of the road. My parents would be stuck somewhere because they had, you know, junk cars. And that's just the way it was growing up. But mm -hmm. I always knew like from some of what I saw from my friends had, I'm like, I want that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then what really did it is when I got to work for this really wealthy guy, I was, you know, 19 years old at the time. And we were at his house in Texas and I got to walk into my first mansion and sit in a Rolls Royce and my jaw hit the ground of like, this is what I, holy cow. Yeah. Um, so that's just, I think from coming from where I did and then getting to see that and how they're normal people too. They just accomplished some really, you know, pretty awesome things. Yeah. And I think something like it's discipline, right? Like it's strict, strict discipline it's just doing the boring things day in and day out mm -hmm. so that you can create the life that you want to live and i feel like it's overlooked a lot of like the mundane tasks that even with a virtual assistant an executive assistant um a dispo manager an acquisition manager like there's still things today that don't you do like every single day that you like maybe didn't think you'd have to do but it's it's just what keeps this business going or right. yeah well, and I think if even when it comes down to the very first guy, he never graduated high school. And probably all of us know that person that didn't graduate high school, but who's now wildly successful later on in life. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of my first, I would say, mentors, which I was like really impressed by. So when I saw normal people doing normal things, but just <laughs> doing them really well um, and becoming wealthy from that, I figured, you know, what, it's an even playing ground once everybody hits, you know, graduates high school. So that's what I loved about real estate was there to me, it didn't feel like there was a limit or a, a, a cap where mm -hmm. if I had a job, you working as a teacher, like no matter if you work double hours because you love teaching, they're not going to pay you anything more than your salary. That blew my mind too. When we first met, you talked about commission and like, I honestly at 20, what was it? 25, 26 when we met. You're 26. I was 26. Oh, a youngster. <laughs> I didn't know what commissions were. I had never been in a job and you're like, at sales like come on like you you know the more you do the more you make and i'm like what, what are you talking about but again it's just like how you're grown up and you stay in a bubble and you just all that's all you know until you open it up and realize how much more is out there and the more that you give you get back i forget that zig ziglar quote i think it is yeah you could always get life with you want what you want by helping enough other people get what they want mm -hmm. so it's really just paying it forward and that's really what it is and focus on that and I think that's been key. We got some friends tuning in right I now. Know. We got Jim uh, and his wife down in AZ, Arizona. Mm -hmm. Some Beautiful awesome state. people there. Yeah, I'm um, glad that this is hitting home. Sometimes just got to be real mm -hmm. and share, right? We got James Buck. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. He's Anybody actually one of our meetups. Hey, Mike. And then Mike, I actually used to work with Mike <laughs> back in the day at the car dealership. And Mike is probably the best car salesman in North America um, that I've ever seen. So, and I'm not wow. just saying that because he's here, I've seen him do his job. <laughs> so, but it, it really comes down to once again, just being kind of normal about it. But the one question I see the most is because they see us running the business and they know it's a lot. Also homeschooling our kids. So how do you balance your time between real estate investing and homeschooling? You want me to answer that? that like <laughs> I know. Like I know. I don't know. I think sometimes I just pretend I'm like Mary Poppins or... You know, I have a magic wand, but no, it's systems and processes, which I, you know, you might roll your eyes when I say that, because I know I used to, right? But the truth is, you know, what gets scheduled happens and what you spend your time on is where your time goes. So for me, at every quarter, I like to do a time audit. And what that means is I sit down and every day for three days straight, I write down from the moment I wake up till I go to bed and I write down what I'm doing with my time. And a lot of times what I find is I have patterns and that pattern is typically around, you know, whatever time of day I kind of have that slump and I'll start scrolling social media. I'm not really somebody who binge watches Netflix, but I definitely can get sucked into the gram or even a little TikTok, right? Um, but you catch your bad habits and then you now know, okay, well, if I find the problem and I am the problem, now I can fix the problem. And so from there, I go to my calendar and I look at when I have great weeks and I have great days, like what did I do? 
And for me, it's scheduling things into there. So I learned quickly, especially with homeschooling two kids, it's, you know, I feel really great if I have one meetup planned a week for these guys to get them out, get them around their friends and ideally more, but sometimes just once a week is what we do. But one week out of the house, they're playing with friends. Tomorrow we're going to go do like an outside splash pad. You know, we're in Florida, like try to enjoy that as much as possible. And then we have strict meetings. So Monday through Friday, we've got our team meetings. I know that those are going to happen. And then you plug and play whatever else needs to happen there. Um, the kids are getting older, so there's a little bit more independent work with homeschooling. So I think people forget too, like that's such a skill that you need to teach your children. Like they need to be able to read and write and do math, but they need to also like try to figure things out and problem solve on their own and give them some time to like get uncomfortable with that for a little bit and then sit with them and work through things. But it also doesn't have to be all Monday through Friday. Like I see some homeschool moms that they teach on weekends. If they're actually working like a strict nine to five, like they can't take breaks, like they'll do Saturday morning or they'll do at night. So you can make it work however your schedule is, but you just again have to be disciplined. And what are you going to give up in order to grow up and grow forward in whatever facet? So for us, it's, you know, we don't really, we're not like out on boats all the time. We're not like beaching it. Like we would love speaking, to we be, <laughs> you know, we take our time off, but that's scheduled too. So I think it's just being mindful of the season of life you're in. And so we have an 11 year old and a nine year old and they are right up there with, you know, making money because you need money to survive and also being able to run multiple businesses. So that's the neat thing about doing this. Bravo to you. Hmm. I mean, I don't, have much to add to that really then you know i kind of just tell you where to show up and when to show up that's what happens and you can <laughs> legitimately say whatever you want we have what's called a, if you make enough decisions in a day you'll have decision, decision fatigue, fatigue yeah right so um the less you could just focus on the big things to help move the needle the better mm -hmm. and so for me i just look at my calendar and before we started really doing this full-time Google Calendar? Are you kidding me? And now I live by. Yeah, you thing. kind of were like not all about it at first, and I'm like, no, we're putting it on. You're you're gonna have to look at the calendar. You're you know, I'm even gonna color code it. So this is your. How long color. did it take for that to happen? But now I can't imagine not having it. I think it was fall of 2020. So we went full time in March, and once we started really growing our team, that was when. I had it. Yeah, we were like, okay, <laughs> like you can't just like try to figure it out because then nothing really gets done. You think you have eight hours in a day and you'll get more accomplished knowing you have 15 minutes rather than if you think you have eight hours. I truly believe that because if you, unless you actually take your eight hours and time block and, and actually like make yourself do the things that you say you're going to do, like you can't just say, Oh, I'm going to work on my real estate investing. But what does that mean? Right? No, it means I'm going to go post my blue ad into Facebook groups from nine to 10. And then from 11 to 12, I'm going to go through my CRM and follow up with people. And then at two o'clock, I'm going to pick up my phone and I'm going to call those people. And then at four, I'm going to start running my comps, right? I'm going to start looking at different properties. And then from there, I might circle back and call my seller back, right? So like you have to like make yourself a map because no one else is going to do it for you. Well, if you have a doctor's appointment, you schedule for that. And this stuff's just as important. Um, so, yeah. So, the one thing, though, I got to say. Oh, hey, Ruth and Jay. Yay. Some of our absolute favorites. <laughs> they are some awesome people. Are doing deals. Like, guys, living the dream. Like, if you want to see some awesome people, uh, Ruth and Jay are incredible. Great friends of ours and uh, great to follow. But I, I got to say the one thing, though, that people see a lot on ours is they see us sharing like the kids in our real estate business. Yeah. And that isn't for clout. Like our kids do way more in our real estate business than we take social media. So once in a while, if you too catch a video, there's so much more behind the scenes, just like anything else that you don't see. But the one question I see is, can we share some of the strategies we use to teach our kids about real estate investing? So is this more of my question? I don't know. A little, well, some of it is organic. Like I'm driving down the road and my daughter is like, what is this burr thing you guys say is so bad, right? And so I'm like, oh boy, she's 11 and here we go. Um, and so sometimes it's just an organic thing like that. But then other times, you know, they're just curious too. Like, what are, why are you guys always on computers? What is a CRM? How can I help? If we have to talk about a deal, they'll be like, why do you keep saying this person's name, <laughs> right? Because like, we'll be talking about a, a situation, one that we're working on. So I think it really comes down to, you know, when 
they've been with us since the beginning doing this because they came to the properties where they're in Jen's belly still. Mm -hmm. And ever since then. So I remember when Brooke being young, you know, being in the stroller coming around one of our houses that we were working on at a weekend or when Bradley was then born after that and Brooke's now running around and he's like in the stroller and all those little cool moments that they've been helping since the beginning. So this is really all they know. Mm -hmm. I think one of Brooke's first jobs so Bradley had to be probably four or five months old, whenever it is that we had Southampton. Yep. And I was bringing mulch over there on a Sunday because we were about to start showing the house. And Sunday is my day off for my car job. So I took Brookie with me. She was a little over two years old. And I think I gave her five bucks to help pick up all the mulch bags. that were all the empties and yep. to gather them all for me. And she was there helping. So, um, And then the bug story, she was there for that one. So that was kind of gross. But so when that happening, our kids have always been in it. Mm -hmm. And so by bug story, he means the time he took our daughter into a flea infested house that tenants moved out of and we didn't know that they had fleas. So and we just walked through it. Like <laughs> that was the weirdest that. part. Literally like two weeks prior, well, you and I both walked it. And they had tons of stuff. In a the lot house. of stuff in there, tons of furniture, but not one flea. No. That we saw. That we noticed anyways. But yeah, I think not... <sighs> Not using ch children as an excuse, not hiding behind them, and then also just being honest and explaining. Because when the pandemic hit, and it was the four of us and those four walls, and we were like, we have to like do videos, and how, how are we going to manage all of this? And at the time, the kids were five and seven, and so... Bradley couldn't even really read yet, but, you know, it was, you know, explaining to them in simple terms, this is how mom and dad are, are going to be able to work from home together. And now daddy doesn't have to go off to the car dealership all, all the time. And when you explain that to my son, like he got it. And so, you know, really involving kids every step of the way and then setting targets, you know, whether it's Disney World, a family trip, getting them excited to go travel more, they see the big picture and they, they truly, they want to be a part of things. So I think the more that you can just, you know, not, if you don't involve them, it gets hard when, if you can involve them as much as possible, it gets easier. Yeah, no, I agree. And I got to say the one thing though, that I hear the most because from being on some of these big podcasts we've been a part of, um, yes, I have left my cell phone number plenty of times. Maybe. And so I do get a lot of calls, which is great because I love to connect with people. And I, I constantly hear all of the time that, you know, they really resonated with our story, you know, from, having two normal jobs to learning how to do this kind of as a side business while getting married and having kids. Right. And just kind of nothing super like crazy. One event that changed everything. There was some along the way that helped for sure, but then they resonated with our story because then once we were put in that position when COVID happened, we were able to pivot, mm -hmm. create this kind of business that we've done. And then obviously move to Florida long before we're 65 and 70 years old and be able to do the things now that wish we could have ever dreamed of. And I always get a lot of times like, Hey, I, I resonated with it with that. Is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's thinking of getting to be a homeschool parent, getting to do this full time? Like if they're just at that W2 job when you were teaching and when I worked at the car dealership, knowing all you know now, what would you have told old Jen and Joe? As far as homeschooling or real estate? Both. Well, I think you just have to start. Like, that's, like, the main point of it. And you got to get out of research mode. And the quicker you can take the messy math of action, I like to call it, and you either pay for some education or you get into the networks and you are masterminding or in a coaching program that's going to literally – you know, step by step, every question you have, like, that's so important, I feel, because had we had that back when you were working, I think we would have, I know we would have gotten a lot further faster, um, instead of kind of taking our time and not really understanding things, um, kind of almost going a little bit like, not in separate directions, but like, I was like, oh, I'm going to go sell Advocare vitamins, and I'm going to sell jewelry, and you let me, because that's what I wanted to do with my spare time. But what, what I ended up learning was all of these amazing social media um, tips and tricks and hacks and realizing like, holy cow, if I couldn't reach the masses <laughs> about vitamins and like energy drinks, uh, I could do this with houses. And you were the one who well, pointed me in that direction. And that, I can't say. So when you told me like, hey, I, I'm like, Jen, try to get into this real estate. And you're like, no, Avocare is the way to go. And I'm like, but you know why? 
because I had a community. And I think that was really like, had there been this like, hey, like here's this awesome community that they're going to like be there while I'm working all these crazy hours and they're going to be on the phone with you and they're going to walk you through everything and they're going to be there because that's what Advocare did. And I know like, you know, think what you kind of about MLMs, but like there were, there was always somebody on a Facebook group or a message or there was a phone call. And so much of it relates to, I mean, it was a mini entrepreneur experience for me. And again, like commissions, I was like, oh, like if I sell more, you make more, right? Like I started understanding the sales process a little bit. So huge growth moment. So I can't even be mad at myself for signing up for those because I think it did like catapult me into a position where we are today. Oh, that's what I was going to say at first rather than, you know, you always want to support your spouse. Um Right. So it wasn't the thing where she's like, hey, let's go in 100 percent real estate together. Let's go. Now she's like, I want to do this instead. But you still support her. And I did. And you know what? That was the best thing I did because it gave her the space to do her thing and learn so much about marketing and, and all the mm -hmm. things that they, you could take from that experience that could really work into this business. And then after that, you started getting into Stella and Dot. Yeah, I started selling Stella and Dot, which was like a jewelry company, whatever. But what I learned from them was go live and the power of going live on your Facebook and like, oh, look at these pretty earrings. Look at this cute necklace. Like, oh, you know, here's my link. You can go and shop it um, and just kind of like talking naturally about it. But then as soon as we started getting serious about real estate in 2017 and we had our first property, you shared it today, I think, or you commented on it. Like, there it was when we went live in front of a property that we had bought. It was a short sale which I learned is nothing short about a short sale. It took forever to buy that property and we were going to completely renovate it. And then our goal was to put in a rent to own buyer. And so I thought, well, what better way than to jump on and share this with the world? So the first time we go live, I was straight up terrified. I didn't even really know what it was. But then when she was like, I'm going to hit the go live button, I was like, what does that mean? She's like, well, when I hit that, like all of our friends and followers and all those, they could see us talking live right now. And I was like, no, don't do that. She's like, too late. Ha ha. And then hit it. And here we are live. So if I look like I'm like a frozen a deer in the headlights, that I legitimately was. <laughs> I didn't think this was going to be a thing. And But she brought these things over to the real estate business that transitioned well. And that was one of the things that we did when even starting our rent to own business is we would go live, what was it, like every Thursday? Mm -hmm. And for every week like we didn't miss it and we had really good turnouts i mean there was sometimes i'd go live and there'd be 70 80 people 100 people mm -hmm. um just could not believe what a time it. when everybody was home <laughs> yeah during covid you weren't getting many people weren't getting out much but that's what we were and we were um, providing a ton of cool stuff going on then so it was really neat to do that but going live definitely changed it so these little tactics i think that worked really well yeah so if you're listening and you're like okay well how does that apply to me like think about some of the, the things the odd jobs or the the careers or the things that are you're kind of intrigued or passionate about and see like how can that translate into the real estate investing world um because sometimes it might be right in front of you and you don't even see it and so if you just take a little bit of time to think and reflect it might pop out well and i think about like my old job i worked at a car dealership i had everything to do with real estate it was just with cars mm -hmm. and once i realized how similar similar they were um i could see where i connected well but quite honestly if you look at some of our our investor friends who are really doing very well one of them she's a nurse and so what does that do for real estate well you know when you're an emergency room nurse you're dealing with folks who are in a, a situation and they're coming to see you and they're kind of in a bad spot and here you are having good bedside manners and walking them through what this is going to be like and hopefully you're there to help so when we're talking with sellers it really boils down to the same thing. How are we able to help people and be nice? It's just that easy. Yeah. So another question I always get are, what are your favorite type of properties to primarily invest in and why? This is S Gen day. <laughs> yeah, this is S Gen live. Oh, I thought these are questions that you're getting here. So. Well, we've gotten a lot of these. So what happens, I get so many DMs. They're yeah. like, hey, Joe, how do I do this? Or what <laughs> kind of advice do you give for that? Well, um, if you asked Jen back in like 2015, 18, 2020, maybe before 2020, I would have said, oh, I love a good fixer upper. You know, I love taking an old junker and making it pretty because there's something cool about that. The gen of 2024 will say, I will take a turnkey, beautiful property. Let's go just take over making payments. And maybe I've got to put in a new smoke alarm. Ideally, I won't even have to do that. But if I need to, I will. 
I'm, I'm with you on that one because, you know, we used to love when we found a really nice neighborhood and found that one ugly house because not only was it neat for us, but it was all the neighbors who'd come over because they want to see what's going on. And they're excited because how many times, like, I'm glad somebody's going to finally fix up that piece of crap, right? Yeah. That, that's legitly what we'd hear. And then we'd make it one of the nicest houses on the street. And when the one neighbor I remember on Southampton, he's like, you'll never get that much for this house. And then he sold his for way over that because we made this beautiful, like this house, like absolutely fantastic. So yeah, um, I think there was always something we really enjoyed out of doing that. However, with you either being working or having the babies or teaching, working, all the other things, but mostly being like a stay home mom full time and taking care of so many other things, you walking on a construction job with two little kids is not what I ideally want you to do. And I'm stuck at work. Yeah. So. Well, the house I was talking about, for example, we ended up having to do it again. So after we got a rent the own buyer in, we had a little kitchen fire. So we ended up having to. They had a little kitchen fire. They, had a fire. <laughs> they move out. We have to renovate it again. He's working. We actually had like two little mini renovations going on. And I remember I walked in with a mirror for the bathroom and the gentleman was there and he's like, oh, are you here to stage the property? I said, no, sir, I own the property. So that's probably one of my favorite moments. But yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work when you, it, it just depends, right? So for us, I saw once we learned how to buy these beautiful turnkey properties, it didn't require all of the time and effort to then manage people to be at the property, the electrician, the contractor, the roofer, you know, getting the inspections done, all of the things that entail. If you've never rehabbed a house, there's a lot that goes into it. And when you have more people in the mix and more to renovate, it's just going to be more problems and usually more money. Um, and so when you can get really efficient and realize I can buy a beautiful turnkey house and then literally not have to do anything to it and then put a rent to own buyer in it, it just makes sense. And it didn't make sense to me until we started doing it. Yeah, when we started doing that strategy, I was like, no more junkers. But yeah, here we are going to fix some flips right now. Still trying to get you out of it. <laughs> but, you know, it, sometimes it's hard. We find these great deals. The way we market for leads, guys, when we have sellers reach out to us, and we find situations where sometimes they will do terms, and sometimes they have a fixer-upper that they don't want to sell in the market. They're ashamed, or they don't want to show it to their friends and neighbors because <clears throat> they don't want pictures online, and they just want to sell it quick, easy off-market. They're willing to give a big discount for that speed and convenience. Plus, that's really what the house is worth. Mm -hmm. um, it's no real thing other than that. But, you know, so sometimes we come across the deals. And so we do these fix and flips virtually too, which, you know, they're fun. It's you're helping still make the neighborhoods beautiful, even though we yeah, don't No, we help the sellers out. And that is important. But it is, it's a lot. It's time consuming and it's just a lot of, what's the word? Staying on top of it too. <laughs> Um, so here's one great question. We call it creative finance playbook, but so many people like, so with creative finance, like how are you financing your deals? Like what bank are, my, are we using or what kind of loan are we getting or things like that? So when you hear terms like creative finance, I guess there are probably creative ways to finance it with a bank and, and things like that. But that's not the real things that we focus on. Um, we actually focus on not doing that. Actually, what we focus on is how to go find deals directly to sellers, our specialties, what we like to do the most, and find out a win-win solution for them. And the one folks that are you know, in a situation where we're able to help and get a good deal on it, but we, we buy a lot of these deals with 100 bucks down, covering closing costs. Not everyone. There's some we put more down, but that's our favorite kind of deal. So that's what we look for and try to focus on doing. So when we're doing $100 down plus some closing costs, or maybe it's $1,000 down and some closing costs, um, you don't really have to use a lender for that, for the bank. Now, if you don't have three, four $4,000 or depending on what it is to close in that deal in your area, depending on where you're dealing deals in the country, sometimes you can borrow some of those closing costs from a friend, a family member or things like that, or even a partner. Um, and I think that's the way there's really, and this is the game changer for us is when we found out we didn't have to use a bank, we don't have to get our credit checked and do the tax returns and, We've got great credit scores, so that really wasn't the thing. But that's a long process if you ever had to do it. And especially if you're burring, it takes time. Um, I don't care if they say 30 days. It's usually more than that. But that's the whole case of it. When we learned how to not have to use banks anymore, that's really what I think changed our business. And then when we implemented rent-to-own at that same time, 
I think that's the thing that really changed because sometimes you're right. You might have to come up with $5,000 between a, a small down payment and a few thousand in closing costs and an insurance policy. But why we love rent to own so much is because when our renters move in and they give us that large, you know, option deposit, um, the non-refundable option deposit, because if they buy um, or if they leave, they don't get that back, but they know that going into it because we want them to buy the house um, and you want to make it a good fit for everybody. And so that's why we're so particular in our process. Um, but when we get that non-refundable option deposit, that usually pays back our closing costs and a little bit of cash down. So in some of these situations, if you structure them correctly, you can get paid to buy real estate. And that's why we love that strategy of buying on terms and selling on terms. Um, I think that's been the key. So um, we love And also, too, house. yeah, just to like piggyback on that, because a lot of people, they are getting, this is what I'm hearing, the word on the street, is they're getting stuck. When they made a deal with a seller that they were going to pay them off or cash them out in three years, and they only have is a long-term renter. And they go to look at what it looks like to refinance right now. Well, and I keep, I keep seeing that a lot. Um, so somebody makes a deal with seller financing, but the, the seller says, you know, I don't want to do this for 30 years. So what you do is you make the payment low, but then you say, okay, in, in five years or three years or two years, I'm going to insert what's called a balloon payment. And that's when the balance is due then. So for the first two or three, five years, however you structure it, you're going to have a nice low payment, but then whatever that, balloon time frame is that's when you owe the existing balance of the house right so where i see what you're bringing up is i see a lot of folks they don't have a strategy of i'm going to buy this i have a three-year term and then i'm going to put in uh, an airbnb or i'm going to put in a long-term renter and then in three years happen and or two years happen or one year happens and then you're looking to refinance it now you have to deal with it appraising you have to deal with getting your credit check, loan process, all of these things, whatever the interest rates are that dictate you at that time. So that's where it comes to be in a really big challenge. And so some of the keys that I like is don't get into a short term that you can't help your seller out, right? You got to stick to your end of the bargain. And if you make it a two year term, you got to figure a way to get that thing cashed out in two years, right? So don't just hope it's going to happen. You better have an action plan, mm -hmm. but that's why we don't do short terms. Number one, number two, we put in somebody who's going to want to own the house down the road at one point with a rent to own program. And before we put them in there, we have it screened. So we know how long it's going to take for them to be mortgage ready. So if they're not right now, they're going to be as long as they stick to these things and we outline what that looks like. So we all go into it with a game plan. We're not just going to throw up in the air and hope it connects like you want to actually help. Right. So do it the right way. And I think the keys, the key to success is in the small details. It's not all the stuff you could just, you know, turn on the TV and see. Yeah. Well, I think too, it's, you know, you need to be conservative and I know people get excited. I just want to do a deal. I just want to do a deal. But at the end of the day, you got to do a good deal and you got to do a deal. that's going to make sense. It's going to make money. It's going to actually help everybody and not just be like, you can't just think short term with creative financing. You really have to think about bigger picture here because when you're taking over a seller's mortgage payment, that's their, their credit is on the line. And if you're not taking that seriously, then you need to have a talk with yourself. <laughs> like what, what's going to happen? You know, make sure you have your proper extra strategies if and when. And that's why I think I just fell in love with rent to own because it just made sense. And then having the proper um, screen, the tenant people who do the, the more, the credit repair we had on last week, Diane and Paul Ritter, they were fantastic and they can be a really key player. And then also having a loan officer like ready to go in that area that they're, they're able to help you with your buyers. So this is not like a total set it, set it and forget it if you have this balloon payment. And I just feel that it's important to talk about that because otherwise some people could just try to figure this out and then. Yeah, it could, you could lead into some real issues. Yeah. So when I hear somebody say, Joe, I've, I've just watched some YouTube videos and I'm just piecing together how to do this. <laughs> you're asking for a recipe for disaster, right? Mm -hmm. Wholesale is a little bit different because you're just looking to find a cash seller at a low price. And then you're looking to find a cash buyer who's going to be willing to pay slightly more than that. You do a close, double close or however assignment. But when you're dealing with creative finance, you could be dealing with people's credit. You're going to be dealing with a long-term relationship, not just a cash deal that's one and done. Mm -hmm. You're going to be tied to these people for years. So there are some small 
uh, things that you're going to really need to be on top of and really be known. Because uh, if you try to just piece this together, I'm telling you, you're going to be uh, setting yourself up for uh, an issue later on. Um, we have a quick question based on that. Do you, know, do you have a typical term length that you do with a seller? So I'm going to give you a little bit of help on that one. I, my favorite is the 30 year, obviously, because it's longer, the better. That's what I'm always looking for. Um, but I don't put my foot in my mouth when I try to find out, are they open to 30 years by just saying, I'm only going to do 30 years or, you know, what's, what do they, um, I keep it really simple. And I just say, if I were to pay that price and I cover all the closing costs, I've had some sellers want to get cashed out 20 to 30 years. And I have some sellers who might get, want to get cashed out sooner, like 10 to 15 years. So if I pay that price and buy it, what's the most amount of time you'd give me? And if you don't need to say all that, just ask them what's the most amount of time you'll give me. But the reason why I do it the way I do is because I'm going to set them up the high and then really what the lowest is. So I kind of you know benchmark myself. And many times you'd be surprised how many that I say, yeah, 30 is fine for me. And I explain to make sure they understand. But, you know, they say 30 is fine. Um, and I have some times where somebody says, Joe, I, I can't do I can't do 10 years. Can you do five? And then you say, you know, can we do like seven or eight? And we try to negotiate. Right. Um, but that's ideally where I want to be is probably 10 plus. But if if I get a really decent deal and they say a seven, eight year term, I'm probably not going to say no to it. But if somebody says, Joe, I want full price for my house and I want you to cash me out in six months or 12 months, I pass on those deals. There's no way I'm going to do it. I won't put that much pressure on myself. Um, so we try to renegotiate either a longer term. I've got one right now really close to us. Lady's a great lady. She's just in a situation. So I at least gave her some advice, I think, on how it could help her position. And it's not us buying it, unfortunately. I would love to because I love this, the spot and location of it. But what's best for her mm -hmm. in that situation isn't me buying it, considering I know what she needs to do. But I kind of gave her some advice what I think would be helpful. And I think she's going to do that. And that's what it's about, too. Like, I I was seeing a coaching call earlier. And, you know, it's not – if we're, like, chasing the number, chasing the deal, chasing the money, like, that doesn't always – doesn't work out in that way but like how can you help this person because you might get on a phone call and just say something that might lead them in the right direction and maybe you're not the answer but you at least help them in and going about it that way like how can I help what can I do to serve you know can I at least give my best of you know what I think you could do in a situation especially in this kind of funky market and I just told her hey like and she's fantastic so I just kind of gave her some advice on hopefully you know what you can do but i mean i love that spot so mm -hmm. it, they don't always win for you but you should try to always make them win for the seller regardless yeah um and that's the best way to do it and we're here to really help and on some you get paid on some you don't but help people and the more you help though the more you will get paid yeah um sure. is there any advice you give to someone um who is trying to get into the real estate market now with today's um interest rates they feel frustrated they're not able to find deals like conventional way and they want to get started in a real estate investment. Well, yeah, I would say you need to just really get great at talking to people and developing your craft of branding yourself and generate those off market leads. And I just immediately think of seller Steve and talk about him a lot, but he was a very first seller finance deal. And he just wanted to walk away and not have that emotional weight on his shoulders from his grandfather's house that was, you know, passed down to him. And he didn't want to go through the, the realtor listing, you know, fixing and changing the house. That was like not something he wanted to do. And I know there's other sellers like that out there. Um, that's just one example. But, you know, that was a zero percent. Right. Five yeah, hundred a month. Because we got zero percent. We, we paid his price and he was thrilled he got that number because where he didn't want to do, if you remember, he didn't want to get some low insulting cash offer because the property had a, a sentimental value to him yeah. too. Uh, but he still gave us a great deal. Yeah. That was the point. It wasn't like he was like overcharging or even charging like top dollar for it. He still gave us a really fair deal on the property, but he didn't he wasn't gonna take that half off. And really, I wouldn't blame him because it really didn't need anything. But he didn't want to have to worry about selling it on the market because I think his renter who worked with him left like a couch and a big old TV behind. And we had to have Kevin drop that stuff off. But mm -hmm. much other than that, um, and but he knowing, like, away. Yeah, to answer that question, is like you have the power to create your own terms. That's the beautiful thing about creative financing. So you first have to believe that there are people out there that are either going to let you take over their low interest rate. Because what were the percentages right now with someone? 
with a low interest rate? I mean, we're still finding two or three percent, but they said it's like sixty something percent of the current mortgage holders across the USA have sixty like six percent mm -hmm. have an interest rate under four percent currently. Mm -hmm. So that means there's a ton of folks out there, a ton. Two out of every three houses they have a mortgage on them right now have an interest rate under four yeah. percent. So either they bought it recently or they refinanced. And sometimes they refinance and they took cash out. Sometimes they just refinance to get a lower rate. But rates were historically low. So we saw a lot of people refinance. So a lot of those people aren't selling. And why would you want to? That's a really low rate. But there's a ton that need to sell for some reason. And they are really looking for some help. And in many places, if they just bought that house not too long ago, in the last two years, um, some pockets of the country didn't wildly appreciate. So if somebody bought it and they need to sell it, if they didn't appreciate a ton, sometimes they don't have any equity. Yeah. And if they're put on the market and you got to take out real estate commissions and fees, I've run into some situations where the seller is going to actually have to write a big check at closing just to get rid of a house they don't want to live in anymore or they don't need anymore. So the fact that we could offer them terms and pay that price and, and pay all the closing costs and how it's a win for them because they don't have to write that check, but it's a win for us because we could buy that property, own it, and still have that 2.25 interest rate with that really low payment. So now it works out well for us too. So that's how we love to create those wins for people and make them happy and us too. Because you got to know there's so many people out there that have properties that they don't want, but you just have to go talk to them. And so that's why we love Facebook and social media because if you brand yourself the right way, you're building that know, like, and trust like instantly. You know, just like we're coming to you live right now and you're watching us or maybe you're listening, you know, you're, you're hearing, you're, you're, you're beginning to, to know, we're building a rapport, you're getting a feel for who we are. And you can do that with your sellers, you know, people that might down the road, you know, want to do business with you, but you don't, you know, know, they don't know who you are unless you consistently put yourself out there. And so I always think about like the person that is just waiting on the other side of our uncomfortable zone you know getting out of our own heads out of our own way making ourselves go live back in the day where <laughs> you thought i was crazy but um you know people are out there and they do need your help and you know i see the question i think it's ruth how would you describe the market along with funky like i say funky because to me it's just crazy just in the last two years i mean you the market goes up and down all around but when we came down to florida two years ago florida was like hot 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 everything listed got sold right away well and over asking. Well over asking, yeah. So like equity was just like pff, crazy. And New York was still rather warm. I mean, our house sold within like two weeks, was it? A week? Not even. I don't even remember. Wait, it was, was a blur. It, yeah, it was like five days it sold. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, but now it's just kind of totally flip-flops. Florida's cooling down a little bit. And New York is like really hot still. So funky as far as the interest rates go too, right? Because like in 2022, the rates were... 2%. They were nice. <laughs> well, and that was the next question was, um, you know, how do you see the market? Is it going to crash or is it still going to continue to rise? And when you say funky, it really depends on almost like per zip code. Yeah. Guys. Um, there's some parts where we are in South what Florida. What funky means, I guess, also in those zip codes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Because like you were mentioning in upstate New York, we see a lot of deals still going for well over asking, mm -hmm. um, well, well over asking. But in some of these places like South Florida, um, I'm seeing it in other cities too, where, you know, what they were asking for these properties, they're actually not getting it. And many times now, especially here in Tampa and in the surrounding areas in Cape Coral in Orlando, um, you're seeing hundred thousand dollar price drops. Sometimes I think the seller list it way too high anyways and they're just shooting for the moon and hopefully they connect but that the days of getting a two and a half percent is over in florida but i think florida's got a weird thing going to it because what happened was all of the real estate since 2019 to 2024 is still appreciated a hundred percent um and since in the last three years insurance rates has also doubled a hundred and two percent rates have gone up in the florida your average homeowner's insurance for the entire state is six thousand dollars a year so that means the little small houses in the middle of the state that really don't ever have much problems including the ones on the beach so if you live you know semi along the coast you're going to be usually spending much more than six thousand dollars a year but now because the prices went up so high the insurance has gone up so high follow that where the taxes too because now everything got reassessed instead of four hundred thousand it's now a 1.2 million dollar property and so once that happened, the assessments went up, insurance went up, 
because now they have to insure a more expensive home. Uh, and now followed up by the interest rates no longer being two and a half percent, it's now unaffordable for most people. So when you're buying a house in Florida, many times you're seeing a six, seven thousand dollar payment for a house. It's not even like the castle. It's not a mansion. That's a pretty nice house in a nice area, probably in a decent school district. So yeah. Florida, I think you might see a little bit more of that. But I think in other pockets around the country, um, you know, on a two hundred thousand dollar home, if the rate went from four percent or to seven, that didn't change the payment much. So I think in some spots it's still kind of hot. So it really depends on where it is. But um, my favorite house is to buy if the market is going up or if the market is going down. The number one house for me that seems to be the most bulletproof in a recession are whatever the area is. Um, I look for great school districts and whatever the median house price range is, anything under that. And I'm talking the 12, 13, 1400 square foot houses, whatever the median house price range is in that area. So if I find an area that's got a really great school district, um, I look for what the median houses sell for in that area. And then I want to be under that. And to me, that's where somebody's looking to either downgrade into a smaller home or they're looking to get their first home. They're looking to get it in a good school district. And I have found that usually the really expensive high-end stuff, really, really high-end stuff, they're buying no matter what. Um, they're not really worried about interest rates. But the middle of the road stuff, a little bit over that, that gets to be a challenge a little bit. But the ones under um, are still my favorites. Mm -hmm. So that's why I want to keep all the ones we have. <laughs> it's hard, but, you know, you got to do it. Um, so one question we've seen pop up is, uh, do you buy bare land too? That's one of my, some of our favorite deals that we've made. Are I feel like we need land. to do some more. Yeah. It's been a while since we did, but, um, my favorite. Yeah. So I was, I think I might've shared the story before, but if you are on Facebook marketplace and you just take a little time instead of like shopping for whatever, like shop for land, right? Cause that's shopping is shopping. <laughs> Once I switched that mentality, I think you're a little happier now. Um, so I found my on marketplace, there was a land for sale, reached out, asked if they do terms. The price just seemed a little bit inexpensive for the area. And so really it's a great way to, if you have a little bit of cash, we ended up using our Roth IRA. You spotted that right away because you're like, hey, honey, um, I want to post our lousy garage sale in this Facebook thing. And then I saw this, our whole neighborhood would do this big block party. We didn't really have a ton of stuff. It was like two boxes. I don't even know why we participated. I don't know. It was, everyone was doing it. I felt like, oh, we have some stuff. I mean, looking back, I wish I had really hauled out <laughs> everything from the basement. I didn't know we were going to move to Florida the following year, but... Yeah, so, you know, finding a little plot of land, it had a for sale by owner. It was and, there forever, too. And it was just sitting there, and I'm like, well, this is so strange because it's such a hot area, great school district, just some vacant land. I even thought for a second, like, oh, would we want to move over there? No. Um, and so we just purchased it, and then we relisted it with a realtor, and we got... So, yeah, we talked to the seller. They were originally asking 9000 which it just seemed low, so... Jen asked, would you do terms? And they said, no, we want all cash. So we asked, they said they would give it to us for 8,000 though. So we said, that's fine. So we did that for 8,000. Um, we put it under contract. We bought it inside of our um, self-directed Roth IRA. And then we reached out to my realtor in the area who we already had conversations with prior. And he said he was going to list it. We didn't really know what we were going to get for it. We know we'd get a good dollar for it, but we got 26.5 for that property. Minus some real estate commissions, I think we cleared like 24,000. Mm -hmm. So we literally just fell into that one. And I think the, like the backstory there was somebody had, had inherited the property. And so some they were living in Kentucky. So yeah. they were out of state. They didn't want to, again, mess around with having to like worry about listing or anything. They just wanted this thing gone. And they just, they had a little price they wanted for it and move along. So speed and convenience, time and energy. And, and that was all. And so I was like, well, that was kind of sweet. So every time I saw a for sale by owner, anywhere where there's land, just like I do with the house. I mean, I just had Brooke send you one yesterday on the way home from Santa. Um, and so anytime you see a for sale by owner, you need to call those people and they probably won't pick up right away. And that's why you need to keep calling them and calling them and calling them. So shout out to Steve who on the next land deal, shout out Steve. He finally got a hold of the seller who was extremely difficult. I don't know if he had like a number. He lived out of, he lived uh, an hour away and this was his niece's house. For some reason they left 
his phone number because she didn't want to deal. They had a house there that burned down years and years and years ago. And it's in this village where there's no room for new houses. And it's really close to a big college. And they have this same thing. They have this crappy for sale by owner sign that you couldn't even barely read. And we just left a house that we bought on terms. Mm -hmm. We are going to check it out. We leave, we get around the corner and Jen just happens to spot this lot. I think I did like a little U-turn and she just snapped some pictures of this terrible little sign, but we got the phone number and uh, we had one of the guys that worked on our team call and this guy would not answer his phone and he definitely would not return any phone num phone calls or text messages. Mm -hmm. But Steve was relentless and just kept on calling this guy and eventually he did answer and just says, yeah, I'm just bad at getting back to people, but I want to sell that lot. So here's the trick guys. If they're, difficult they don't answer your call they're probably not answering anybody else's call either so if you just stick with it they're advertising they have something for sale we would think they would just gladly answer their phone and want to sell it as quick as possible but you know we're all different um so just stay on it and um that's how we got that deal was we bought that one for the same thing in our ira how do you remember all the numbers <laughs> oh we bought it for twelve thousand dollars <laughs> And that was the same one that we sold. I think it was the same thing. Like it was like 26,000 or 28,000 for that one we sold it for. Um, and that was a really great deal. And too. I think that works. If you're listening and you're like, well, I kind of live in the middle of nowhere or I'm kind of in a small town. Like that is your like best spot. I feel like small towns where you just think everyone knows everyone, but then there's just like this random old for sale by owner sign. Um, definitely reach out and call and, you know, just, again, you're asking questions and see what they would take. And, you know, if it's something that you don't have that cash for, can you then, you know, assign that contract to somebody else or, you know, reach out to somebody who knows what they're doing, you know, and, and make some money that way. But it's just taking that action, asking the questions. And definitely there's a lot of, and I'm going to drop a little gem, the crappier, the sign <laughs> they have there that says for sale by owner, the better. Yeah. Um, if it's a really nice, beautiful, professional sign, you can still make the deal. But if it's one that you could barely read the letters on and it's all faded and the thing's been kicked over and ran over by the lawnmower four times, but it's still sitting there somehow, um, that's the one to call. Yeah, because oftentimes, too, they're not on Zillow. No. neither. None of these were on yeah. Zillow. Yeah. They were just sitting out there hoping someone would see it, and someone did. <laughs> and then there was the one plot of land that we did where – my actual mom found it on Craigslist and was like, hey, here's this lot. It's 20 acres. And the seller was asking at one point 180000 for the property. They dropped it down to, I think it was like 110. I put an offer for 50000 because it was sitting there for two years. But they never put it on the MLS. They never put it on Zillow. Once again, little sign on the side of the road. And they just happened to put it on Craigslist. So I called, I put an offer for 50. They said they won't take that. They would do 60. We bought that land for 60. It was 20 acres in upstate New York. And what was, was the original price they listed it for? 180. We bought it for I'm just that. So everybody could hear that again because those numbers are a bit wild. Yeah. Well, it was also sitting there in the market and the agent who was listing the property, who was a friend of the family, never put it on the MLS. So I don't know what they did or did not do, but they did a zero job of marketing the property. Um, shout out to that realtor. Thank you for that. Deal. <laughs> but what happened was on that deal, we actually bought it and we were going to plan on building a house on it. We, we had cleared some spot for the house. We made some cool trails in the back, 20 acres. It was an old apple orchard that was overground. Once we cleared out some trails, found out there's these huge, beautiful apple trees. So we really liked it. And then when COVID happened, the reason why we liked it so much, it was close to my job. And then when I realized I don't have that job because COVID started and I don't have to live in upstate New York anymore. We um, didn't know at that point. Oh, we sure. did. You, you already had it started. <laughs> no, and I, I love upstate New York. I do. I just don't like the cold. No, um, but it was just not in the plans anymore. We even had actual blueprints drawn up for that. So, you know, if you think you're like going in one direction, but then something else completely happens, sometimes it just is what it is. And so we ended up scratching the plans of building and uh, we relisted that. Uh, on the actual MLS. On the MLS a couple of years later, and we got 132 for it. Mm -hmm. So it turned out to be a really great deal. Um, you know, it was kind of like a little heartbreaking. I'm not going to lie when it first happened because that was the dream to have a house on 20 acres and we could go out back and, you know, all that good stuff. But looking back on it, thank gosh. My gut never felt right there. I don't know what it was. But. Well, it was also close to kind of a busier road too. And yeah. Just a matter of time. 
But land is, is spectacular. We did a great interview a while back. Go check that one out with uh, Ray. And he is he dropped some good nuggets there on, on land. So. Yeah, we have some really great investor friends who specialize in land. Yeah. But it, it's great. You know, there's no tennis. There's no toilets. Um, there's some neat things to know. <laughs> have you seen that lately where, like, people are, they always talk about toilets. But, like, I've never been called about a toilet issue. I've seen toilet issues before, let me tell you. <laughs> I was like, I have, yeah. I remember one of our properties that always has to get snaked by the town. Oh, that's because the town. Uh, yeah. I mean, the call comes into us first to say, hey, but. Because the town's piping is all old. So what they yeah. do is they give you a free snaking service um, because they know. But yeah, no, it's part of being a landlord, guys. Yeah. Uh, but that's why we love rent to own. You get way less of those calls. So great session today. I yeah, say. that was super, super fun. I liked being able to answer some questions. Well, I have so many that we never even got to. So we're going to have to do this do again, again because like once I put that number out there, like there's a bunch of questions here. I got so many more um, <laughs> that I've not even got a chance to, but it's kind of neat because we're, we're seeing people from all over the country who are reaching out and hearing what's making them win and what they're doing in their business. And it's pretty awesome too. So uh, thank you guys for so much for tuning in today. Um, don't forget, we go live every Tuesday at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So if you want to be part of this live, come join us. We'd love to see you. Um, we also are streaming to all the podcast channels too. So if you want to check us out on Spotify, Apple, Apple, YouTube, or it's all there. Leave us a review if you like what you hear. Let us know, and we'll uh, definitely bring you more as much as we can. We and give love... Jen a five star review while you're at it. Give I us mean, a five star. Let's yeah. go, giddy up! But yeah, so we love just bringing back every single time, every week. What is kind? Of, what's going on in the, in the real estate industry? How you could get started getting your first deal? And if you're ever in this, if you're ever thinking about how do I get started, reach out. You know, I post my cell phone number all over the place. Um, send us a message. We'd love to connect. That's my favorite thing to do is to connect. And if we could help you get that first deal, high five to all. But I will tell you, there are more people out there who need our help than there are people looking to help them. So mm -hmm. reach out, talk to some people, find a way to help. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful day. High five to you, girl. Yay. All right, Thanks guys. So we'll see you next week. See Bye. you guys.